organized by European Health and Innovation Center, Faculty of Biomedical Engineering, Silesian University of Technology, American Heart of Poland, and Philips Company. Uh, Health Tech Innovation Conference, it is continuation of Silesian Biomedical Engineering Conference dating back to 2012. The conference, it is a platform for exchanging experience for collaboration between engineers, medical doctors, rehabilitants, and coaches different sport disciplines. Uh, generally, the conference, it is a part of our strategy of eco-business system creation around our European Health Tech Innovation Center. Uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to extend a very special welcome to our honorary guests. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Olga Rudnieva. Olga, <laughs> let's... Olga Rudnieva is a CEO of the Superhuman Center, a new state-of-the-art world victim rehabilitation center for adult and children being set up in Lviv. Uh, Olga, uh, we, I, I think on behalf of all of us, uh, I would like to express our solidarity to your country. We all believe that you win uh, and we are together with you. Thank you so you coming to us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that during the conference we write together with Olga and of course we invite all scientists to write roadmap for, the, for collaboration between your institution, our institution and Superhuman Center represented by Olga. Thank you again. So allow me to uh, introduce what to welcome and introduce Professor Martinkova, uh, representing, representing Technical University of Ostrava, Welcome, Professor. Uh, allow me to welcome Professor Michael Anderson, representing Auburn University. Welcome, Professor. Welcome our ambassador of our collaboration between Philips Company and Silesian University of Company, uh, Silesian University of, of uh, Technical University, Andrzej Hajdasiński, representing Nairobi Business University. Welcome, Professor. Proszę Państwa, teraz przywitam gości, którzy reprezentują instytucje polskie w języku polskim. Na wstępie chciałbym bardzo serdecznie przywitać gospodarza miasta Zabrze, w którym jest ulokowany Wydział Inżynierii Biomedycznej, Wydział Organizacji Zarządzania, Kampus Politechniki Śląskiej i nasze centrum. Witam panią dr Małgorzatę Mańkę Szulik, prezydenta miasta Zabrze. Witamy w tym szczególnym roku stulecia miasta Zabrze. Bardzo serdecznie witam y, rektora poprzedniej kadencji Politechniki Śląskiej, pana profesora Andrzeja Karbownika. Witamy, panie rektorze. Proszę państwa, naszą konferencję organizujemy pod patronatem pani prezydent, rektora Politechniki Śląskiej i rektora Śląskiego Uniwersytetu Medycznego, pana profesora Tomasza Szczepańskiego. Śląski Uniwersytet Medyczny jest reprezentowany przez prorektora, profesora Damian, Damiana Czyżewskiego. Witamy, panie prorektorze. Przejścia przy stole prezydenty, przy prezydialne witam współorganizatorów dziekana Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej, pana profesora Zbigniewa Paszendę. Natomiast Filips Polska reprezentuje wiceprezes Michał Kępowicz. Witam panie prezesie. Proszę Państwa, nie moglibyśmy się rozwijać bez przychylności miasta Zabrze. Dziękujemy przy każdej okazji pani prezydent Małgorzacie Mańce Szulik, ale dziękujemy Radzie Miasta Zabrze, reprezentowanej dzisiaj przez panią przewodniczącą Rady Miejskiej Łucję Chrząstek Bar. Witamy panią przewodniczącą. Proszę Państwa, ja bym teraz wymienił, jest to dość długa lista gości, których pozwólcie Państwo, że na końcu przywitamy brawami. Bardzo serdecznie witam rektora Akademii Wychowania Fizycznego, pana profesora Grzegorza Jurasa. Witam panią prorektor Politechniki Białostockiej, panią profesor Agnieszkę Dardzińską. Witam dyrektora Śląskiego Centrum Chorób Serca, pana profesora Piotra Przybyłowskiego. Witam dyrektora <śmiech> Narodowego Instytutu Onkologii w Gliwicach imienia Marii Kiri Skłodowskiej, pana profesora Krzysztofa Składowskiego. 
Witam pana profesora Krystiana Witte, wicedyrektora Górnośląskiego Centrum Medycznego Uniwersytetu Medycznego w Katowicach. Witam dyrektora Generalnego Fundacji Rozwoju Kardiochirurgii, pana doktora Jana Sarne. Witam dyrektora sieci bada badań Łukasiewicz, Instytut Techniki i Aparatury Medycznej, pana profesora Janusza Wróbla. Witam pana profesora Pałko, konsultanta krajowego w Inżynierii Medycznej w Ministerstwie Zdrowia. Witam pana profesora Tomasza Koszuckiego, prezesa Elekta Polskiego Towarzystwa Chirurgów Dziecięcych. Witam pana profesora Larysza, prezesa Polskiego Towarzystwa Leczenia Twarzy i Czaszki, kierownika Kliniki Chirurgii Głowy i Szyi na Uniwersytecie Warmińsko-Mazurskim w Olsztynie. Witam pana profesora Aleksandra Nawrata, dyrektora Centrum Cyberbezpieczeństwa Polityki Śląskiej, członka Rady Narodowego Centrum Badań Rozwoju. Witam pana profesora, profesora Gacka, byłego dyrektora Instytutu Techniki i Aparatury Medycznej, aktualnie pełniącego funkcję pełnomocnika dyrektora do spraw współpracy naukowej. Witam pana doktora Michała Kwietnia, dyrektora sieci badań Łukasiewicza, Krakowski Instytut Technologiczny. Witam pana Norberta Komara, dyrektora Górnośląskiego Centrum Rehabilitacyjnego Repty Śląskie. Witam dziekanów, którzy zaszczycili nas swoją obecnością, ponieważ w ramach konferencji jest organizowane spotkanie dziekanów uczelni, gdzie realizowany jest kierunek inżynierii biomedycznej. I tak, witam pana profesora Andrzeja Cichonia, dziekania Wydziału Elektrotechniki, Automatyki i Informatyki Politechniki Opolskiej. Witam pana dziekana Wydziału Inżynierii Mechanicznej Politechniki Poznańskiej, pana profesora Olafa Ciszaka. Witam pana profesora Dariusza Bojczuka, dziekana Wydziału Zarządzania i Modelowania Komputerowego Politechniki Świętokrzyskiej. Witam pana profesora Władysława Papacz, dziekana Wydziału Magicznego Uniwersytetu Zielonogórskiego. Witam pana profesora Jerzego Składka, dziekana Wydziału Magicznego Politechniki Krakowskiej. Witam profesora Sebastiana Stacha, dziekana Wydziału Nauk Ścisłych i Technicznych Uniwersytetu Śląskiego. Witam prodziekanów, panią profesor Elżbietę Pamułę z AGH Krak Kraków. Witam pana profesora Roberta Iskandera z Politechniki Wrocławskiej. Witam pana prodziekana Izworskiego z AGH. Witam pana profesora Szarguta, prodziekana Wojskowej Akademii Technicznej. Witam pana profesora Badurę, to prodziekanie Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej naszego, naszego wydziału, naszej uczelni. Witam panią prodziekan Majewską i prodziekana profesora Michnika. Witam pana dyrektora Regionalnego Centrum Krwiodawstwa i Krwiolecznictwa, pana Stanisława Dylonga. Witam pana profesora Tomasza Bieleckiego, zastępcę dyrektora do spraw medycznych Szpitala Świętego Józefa w Mikołowie. Witam panią Urszulę Koszucką, radną Sejmiku Województwa Śląskiego, ale także dyrektor poradni psychologicznej. Witam pana profesora Nawrata, dyrektora Instytutu Protez Serca Fundacji Rozwoju Kardiochirurgii. Witam panią profesor Jolantę Pałk, dyrektora Instytutu Inżynierii Biomedycznej na Wydziale Mechanicznym Politechniki Białostockiej. Witam pana wicedyrektora Dyrektora profesora Klekiela, wicedyrektora Instytutu Inżynierii Materiałowej i Inżynierii Biomedycznej Uniwersytetu Zielonogórskiego. Witam panią profesor Katarzynę Arkusz, kierownika Katedry Inżynierii Biomedycznej Uniwersytetu Zielonogórskiego. Witam panią profesor Monika damczyk sowy kierownik Katedry Kliniki Neurologii Zabrze Śląski Uniwersytet, Med Śląski Uniwersytet Medyczny w Katowicach. Witam pana profesora Ratajskiego, kierownika Katedry Inżynierii Biomedycznej Wydziału Mechanicznego Politechniki Koszalińskiej. Witam pana profesora Jacka Rumińskiego, kierownika Katedry Inżynierii Biomedycznej Wydziału Elektroniki, Telekomunikacji i Informatyki Politechniki Gdańskiej. Witam pana profesora Buszmana, za, założyciela i, e, i prezesa wie, przez wiele lat American Heart of Poland. Witam pana profesora Fujarewicza, kierownika Katedry Inżynierii Biologii i Systemów Politechniki Śląskiej. Witam panią profesor Ewę Piętkę, kierownika Katedry Informatyki Sztucznej i Inteligencji Politechniki Śląskiej oraz członka Rady Naukowej, członka Rady Doskonałości Nauki przy Ministerstwie Edukacji i Nauki. Witam pana profesora Ewarysta Tkacza, kierownika Katedry Biosensorów i Przetwarzania Sygnałów Biometrycznych Politechniki Śląskiej. Witam proszę państwa przedstawicieli zaprzyjaźnionych instytucji, w tym również instytucji dbających o współpracę między nauką i biznesem. Bardzo serdecznie witam przedstawicieli firm, którzy z nami współpracują, którzy nas wspierają. Witam pana dyrektora Dominika Ogonowskiego i panią dyrektor Mirosławę Kaszczyk reprezentujący firmę Balton. Witam pana prezesa Antonowicza Piotra z firmy Rutpol Opa. Witam pana dyrektora Fabryki Narzędzi Medycznych Hirmet Marcina Dynerta. Witam prezesa PHU Technomex Janusza Franczyka. Witam dyrektora 
operacyjnego Enforce Medical Technologies Adama Gramale. Przecież w tym miejscu chciałbym bardzo serdecznie podziękować fundatorom, sponsorom tej konferencji, bez których nie mogłaby się konferencja odbyć. Jak zawsze witam, witam tutaj wśród nas przedstawicieli firmy Philips i im bardzo dziękuję za wsparcie finansowe dla wielu inicjatyw. Dziękuję za wsparcie finansowe firmie Hirmet, firmie Yoshi oraz Enforce Medical Technologies, naszym, naszym sponsorom. Wszystkich przywitajmy gromkimi brawami. Proszę Państwa, witam wszystkich uczestników niewymienionych naszej konferencji. Witam również studentów, doktorantów, wszystkich, którzy Państwo zaszczyciliście naszą dzisiejszą konferencję. A teraz proszę o zabranie głosu Panią Prezydent i przywitanie uczestników naszej konferencji. Pani Prezydent, bardzo proszę. Panie profesorze, szanowny panie dziekanie, drodzy zaproszeni goście, ale przede wszystkim droga szanowna młodzieży. Dear professor, uh, honorable guests and uh, first of all of course, of course uh, the honorable youth people, young students. Z ogromnym zadowoleniem i z pewnym wzruszeniem stoję dziś tu przed państwem. Pamiętam jak wydział inżynierii biomedycznej w Zabrzu stawiał pierwsze kroki i nie podejrzewałam, że w takim tempie dobiegnie do tak wyjątkowego miejsca. At this moment I would like to just express my uh, my gratitude because as far as I remember I remember the first time that the faculty has started the first steps and nowadays you know it has reached the, the present current state. Przede wszystkim gratuluję panom dziekanom, panu rektorowi wyboru tego kierunku, ale też gratuluję młodzieży że właśnie zechcieli studiować na jedynym w Polsce wydziale inżynierii biomedycznej. I would like to express my gratitude to professors uh, that they've decided to take a chance on biomedical engineering, but uh, especially, uh, especially words, uh, welcome words are, are dedicated to students who decided to take a chance on biomedical engineering. Oczywiście świętujemy dziś z wami, dziś kolejna konferencja, będziemy przysłuchiwali się bardzo cennym wykładom, ale przez cały rok obserwujemy państwa działania i obecności Lewandowskiego na wydziale trudno ukryć. Robert Lewandowski jest tylko przykładem tego, jak niesamowite projekty państwo realizujecie od medycyny poprzez sport. No, Oczywiście technologia też w tym wszystkim bardzo aktywnie uczestniczy. Mm -hmm. Robert Lewandowski jest just an example of, the, of our activity in the field of biomedical engineering, but of course there are a lot of other fields that for sure um, uh, the, uh, the employees of the faculty are involved in. Nie byłoby tego wszystkiego bez tej długiej listy gości, którym jeszcze raz serdecznie się kłaniam, a szczególnie dziękuję sponsorom za współtworzenie tego sukcesu. Myślę, że to bardzo ważne i nie tylko dla miasta Zabrze, ale przede wszystkim dla nauki. It wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be like that here right now at the moment without the uh, support of uh, of our sponsors of all the other and we would like to, uh, right now at this moment I would like to just once again thank you all the sponsors and all the people who are involved who were involved in the process. Ta konferencja zdobyła już wielu przyjaciół, tak więc wszystkim przyjaciołom, sponsorom, organizatorom, ale przede wszystkim młodzieży kłaniam się nisko, życzę bardzo owocnych obrad i wszystkiego, wszystkiego co najpiękniejsze. Wszystkiego dobrego. The conference has reached <laughs> yeah, the conference has reached many friends right now, but of course at this time I think that you know it will be just a very good opportunity for all, for all of us just to uh, just to stand a couple of hours today just discussing the interesting subjects related to science, but of course all the welcome warming is coming straight to you. Thank you. Gratuluję.
Now I would like to invite uh, Dean of Faculty of Biomedical Engineering, Faculty at Sileja University of Technology, Professor Pashenda. Professor, take the floor, please. <coughs> Pani Prezydent, Szanowni Państwo, rok 2022 jest rokiem szczególnym. My, jako Wydział, obchodzimy dwunastolecie istnienia, a Zabrze świętuje stulecie nadanie praw miejskich. The year 2020 is special, is, is special uh, especially for us. Why? Because new, we as a faculty, we celebrate the 20, uh, 12th anniversary of our, uh, of our being here in the faculty, but here at the same time, the, uh, we celebrate the anniversary of 100 years of city of Zabrze. Proszę Państwa, Pani Prezydent w swoim wystąpieniu wspomniała, jak rozwija się Wydział Inżynierii Biomedycznej Politechniki Śląskiej w Zabrzu. Uh, Ms. President mentioned how the, the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering is being developed here in Zabrze. Oczywiście to ogromne zaangażowanie pracowników Wydziału. For sure it's, oh, sorry, for sure it's, very, uh, it's very, very hard work for employees of the faculty. Jednak mamy świadomość, że bez wsparcia ze strony władz samorządowych miasta Zabrze nie udałoby się nam osiągnąć tego, czym dzisiaj możemy się szczycić. But of course we are quite aware that without uh, special uh, support from the authorities of city of Zabrze we wouldn't be able to just achieve the, uh, the, the, the goal, the, the place where we are right now. Jako przedstawiciel społeczności akademickiej Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej w imieniu wszystkich pracowników, studentów chciałem podziękować władzom samorządowym za ogromne wsparcie. On behalf of my, myself and the uh, whole the faculty and whole community of biomedical engineering as well as all employees of the faculty, I would like to just express my gratitude strictly to, uh, to authorities of Zabrze Chciałem na ręce Pani Prezydent Miasta Zabrze, Pani Doktor Małgorzaty Mańki-Szulik i Przewodniczącej Rady Miasta złożyć najserdeczniejsze podziękowania za tak doskonałą współpracę, ale i wsparcie nas we wszystkich dotychczasowych działaniach. I would like to express, express my gratitude directly to President Małgorzata Mańka Szulik and the local authorities, uh, Rada Miasta, just for, the, for their support, for being with us, and for the tremendous input in the development of Faculty of Biomedical Engineering. Dlaczego Wydział Inżynierii Biomedycznej znajduje się w Zabrzu? Why the, why the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering is being located in Zabrze? Szanowni Państwo, tu znaleźliśmy swój dom, tu możemy się rozwijać, tu może, mamy stworzone warunki do tego rozwoju, a y, studenci, młodzież może kształcić się w tak interesującym obszarze, jakim jest inżynieria biomedyczna. Here we found our home, here we've got the possibilities for development and our students has got a chance to, uh, to just fulfill their needs and expectation in the field of biomedical engineering. Poproszę Panią Przewodniczącą Rady Miasta, Panią Lucję chrzęstek bar o podejście tutaj do stołu prezydialnego. I would like to invite the President Lucja chrzęstek bar just in order to come here. Panią Prezydent, oczywiście zapraszam również. Szanowni Państwo, w tym momencie chcieliśmy na ręce Pani Prezydent, Pani Przewodniczącej złożyć podziękowania i poproszę Pana Profesora Marka Gzika, dziekana poprzednich dwóch kadencji, żebyśmy wspólnie mogli 
podziękować władzom samorządowym za wszystko, co udało nam się tutaj zrealizować. Right now I would like to just express, I would like to ask Professor Marek Dzik just uh, to, uh, we would like to thank uh, President Małgorzata Mańka Szulik and the Chairman of the Council City Hall uh, just for the cooperation and for, our, uh, for, for their support for our activities for all these years. Pani Prezydent, Pani Przewodnicząca, jeszcze raz w imieniu całej społeczności akademickiej bardzo dziękujemy za ogromne wsparcie za żyściach. Mam nadzieję, że miasto Zabrze dumne jest też, że tutaj znajduje się jedyny Wydział Inżynierii Biomedycznej. Natomiast my jesteśmy dumni, że jesteśmy w Zabrzu i możemy się rozwijać. I would like to especially express my gratitude for so far activity really, uh, raised by, by city of Zabrze. And of course, I do believe that it's mutual. It's mutual that we here, uh, that the city of Zabrze is also proud of us because we just feel as a child uh, of Zabrze, but as well, of course, as a kind of a father of a common success. So at this moment, once again, we'd like to express, uh, want to give you. Panowie profesorowie poprosili o zabranie głosu. Ja myślę, że już wszyscy czekamy na wykłady. W związku z powyższym, szanowni panowie profesorowie, panowie dziekani, bardzo to miłe i ogromny to dla mnie zaszczyt zostać uhonorowaną tyloma tyloma wspaniałymi i słowami i, i tymi pamiątkami, które będą mówiły o tym, że Wydział Inżynierii Biomedycznej w Zabrzu pięknie się rozwija. Mamy pełną świadomość, że nie byłoby tego, gdyby nie wasz upór, wasza determinacja i wasz oczywiście pomysł. Ja tylko, jak wszyscy w Zabrzu wiedzą, jak coś dobrego w Zabrzu się urodzi, to nie wypuszczę z Zabrza. W związku z powyższym e, jeszcze raz dziękuję serdecznie i życzę dużo, dużo sukcesów, a młodzieży gwarantuję, że pójście tą drogą to najlepszy kierunek. Dziękuję najserdeczniej. Szanowni Państwo, ja jako dumna absolwentka Politechniki Śląskiej chciałabym serdecznie podziękować. Naprawdę bardzo się cieszę, że współpraca między miastem a Politechniką tak dobrze się układa. Ale to dzięki właśnie tutaj współpracy panów profesorów i pani prezydent te 12 lat temu podjęto taką decyzję. I z tego jestem bardzo dumna. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję bardzo. Proszę zająć miejsce. Szanowni Państwo, Wydział Inżynierii Biomedycznej tak dynamicznie rozwija się dzięki określonym osobom, dzięki określonym instytucjom. The Faculty of Biomedical Engineering is being developed, has, been, has been developing since uh, very specific people and very specific institutions. 10 lat temu powstał pomysł nagradzania ludzi bądź instytucji, które w sposób szczególny przysłużyły się dla rozwoju Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej. Ten years ago the faculty decided to award uh, people who were especially uh, involved in the process of development of the faculty. Do tej pory wręczyliśmy dziewięć statuetek zasłużonych dla Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej. Till now we awarded 10 uh, nominees with uh, statues of uh, dis, uh, distinguished science to the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering. Wyróżnione zostały następujące osoby. Pani, the, following, the following people uh, were awarded. Pani Prezydent Miasta Zabrze, Pani Doktor Małgorzata Mańka-Szulik, 
rektor Politechniki Śląskiej w latach 2008-2016, profesor Jerzy Karbownik. Przepraszam, przepraszam, panie rektorze, Andrzej Karbownik. Pan profesor Jan Marciniak, pan profesor Eugeniusz Świtoński, rektor Politechniki Śląskiej Arkadiusz Mężyk, pani profesor Piętka, pierwszy dziekan Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej, pan profesor Andrzej Hajdasiński, pan Artur Polak, prezes firmy APA Group i firma Royal Philips za jako uhonorowanie wsparcia w realizacji projektu właśnie w, w ramach którego powstało in, Europejskie Centrum Inżynier Inżynierskiego Wspomagania Medycyny i Sportu. Jest mi niezmiernie miło poinformować, że na podstawie decyzji kapituły dziesiątą jubileuszową statuetkę powinni, chcieli, postanowiliśmy przyznać panu dziekanowi w kadencji 2.12-2.20 Twórcy pomysłu Europejskiego Centrum Innowacyjnego Technologii dla Zdrowia, Europejskiego Centrum Innowacyjnych Technologii dla Zdrowia, a przede wszystkim za rozwój Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej i, jego, i, i zapewnienie wysokiego poziomu na arenie y, krajowej i międzynarodowej. Szanowni Państwo, statuetkę zasłużony dla Wydziału Inżynierii Biomedycznej otrzymuje pan profesor Marek Gzik. Szanowni Państwo, przechodzimy teraz już do sesji plenarnej. Now we move to the plenary session. i zaprosi, że jest wykład. Pierwszy wykład wygłosi pani Olga. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the plenary session. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Olga Rudneva uh, from Superhuman Center and the uh, presentation will be about the Superhuman Center and challenges in healthcare system due to war. Thank you, Olga. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Olga. I'm from Ukraine, and probably I will start my presentation 
with a little bit of talking about my country. I was born in Donetsk, uh, and I spent all my childhood in Crimea. In 2014, I lost my first house, then I lost Crimea, then I moved to Kiev. Um, on February 24th, I woke up to the war. And I don't want to frighten you, but there is nothing in your life that can actually compare with the feeling when you wake up and everything that you had before disappears in one day. And your new life from the zero ground starts again. My journey that lasts for 228 days started that day. I left my country and I moved to Poland and I want to thank all Polish people and Polish government for amazing welcome that Ukrainians received here. Poland became our transition point, the place where we stayed, the place where we got our homes, and the place that we stay when we move somewhere else. I spent six months in Lublin working for humanitarian warehouse, and uh, now we are building a hospital in Ukraine. Let me tell you a little bit about the situation that is in Ukraine right now. While I was coming here from Warsaw, and my train took three hours, 40, 83 rockets were launched in Ukraine. 41 of them were stopped. The rest landed in my country. In the center of Kyiv today, eight people were killed. And I spent all my morning texting my friends and beloved ones because they are in Ukraine right now, and I have no idea whether they are alive or not. Some rockets left, uh, landed on infrastructure objects. Half of the crane of Ukraine is left without electricity and without water. And this is the reality that we are facing in 2022. Right now, we have some data that we are dealing with. We know that more than 6,000 6, people were killed in Ukraine, and these are civilians, and around 9,000 people already are wounded, and they are all over Ukraine and abroad as well. You see the picture of this gentleman? He lost his son in Kharkiv due to the bombing of the bus stop. Uh, his son was 11 years old, and this gentleman was sitting next to him, next to this child for two hours, just praying, and nobody could take him away from that point. We know that around 1,000 children were killed in Ukraine starting from the February 24th. We also are finding mass graves when we are deoccupying our territories. My house, which is next to Kiev, was totally robbed and destroyed. But this cannot compare to what we found when we, went to, when we entered Bucha and Arpin. It's like mass we have mass graves of people killed and tortured all over Ukraine at the moment. This small girl, she got her prothesis recently in Italy. She lost her limb due to the Russian uh, rocket attack in one of the cities in Ukraine. We also talking about, at the moment, this is a little bit you know, old information. We talk about hundreds of children who lost their limbs. And we talk about thousands of Ukrainian kids who lost their parents. And also, UN is talking about 50,000 of Ukrainian children being moved to Russia uh, for different reasons, for adoption, for rehabilitation. And we anticipate that these kids will never, ever return to Ukraine. This is a picture from mass bombing in Mariupol in the maternity house. So this is absolutely civilian object, and there is no military infrastructure there. You probably have seen that in your news, but almost 12 million people left Ukraine. Lines on the Poland border was lasted for, hour, for, for days. And some people were escaping with children, with pets. And again, I want to thank Poland and Polish government for accepting all these people, even without documents, and giving them home and houses. 
a lot of people lost their houses and there is no way for them to return. So they don't have a place to live anymore because their houses and their apartments are ruined. Um, also, we are talking about lots of infrastructure objects that are, they don't exist anymore. We lost thousands of schools, thousands of medical entities, and we lost thousands of kilometers of our roads. 120,000 homes destroyed or damaged, and these numbers just you know, went up today in the morning because the whole Ukraine was you know, severely attacked by Russian terrorists. Um, the economical situation is quite you know, tragic at the moment, but we have worldwide support. And this all brought us to the point when we start thinking what we can do, because we understand that government will probably be concentrating on rebuilding the country, rebuilding the hospitals, and rebuilding the schools. But at the same time, we understand that government budget only allowed to cover you know, reconstruction and salaries for people. Government budget and healthcare system cannot afford high quality medical services for Ukrainian um, civilians and military personnel. This is my friend, Ukrainian lawyer and um, uh, very well-known uh, advocate. He lost his eye during the, uh, the combat field, and now he is back in Kiev and trying to communicate you know, the difficulties of being at the front lines. Because a lot of people who went to the front lines at the first days of the war had no special uh, preparation, and they basically learned as they go. So that's the general data of the casualties. It's the general data of the situation in Ukraine, and that's how actually the, the world looks like. Uh, we understand that a lot of people at the moment lost their limbs. A lot of people need psychological support, and a lot of people need reconstructive surgeries. To a great pity, government is only covering partially uh, prosthetics services and not covering reconstructive surgeries at all, because we are all concentrated on providing emergency services, basically saving the lives. That's all we can afford at the moment. The rest is assumed to be luxury service. And we understand, looking at the data from Iraq and Afghanistan, that a lot of people will need reconstructive surgeries. A lot of people will need prosthetics, and a lot of people will need psychological support because the war trauma, it's very deep. And according to the latest um, researches, uh, we see the data that uh, PTSD, which is trauma from the war, can be transmitted from mother to child. So in May, we started the process of developing the center for, uh, for people injured during the war. We don't call our people victims. We call people injured during the war because we, because we do not consider Ukraine as victims of war because we are fighting back. And as you mentioned before, we're going to win this war and we are winning it. But the price is very high. The price is lives and health of our people. The Superhuman Center will be uh, situated in Lviv, at the western part of Ukraine, which is relatively safe. I have to say that there is no safe place in Ukraine right now. But Lviv is relatively safe. It's going to be based on a veteran hospital, which already see a lot of veterans, a lot of military personnel, and a lot of civilians. And basically, it will, it will provide four services. Uh, it will provide psychological support for all patients. So the first step when the patient arrives is basically to do the psychological and psychiatrical evaluation and to see whether this person is ready for further work with him. Then he will either get his prosthesis or he, will get a, he or she will get reconstructive surgeries. And then we move our patient, patients to a rehabilitation process, which can last up to three months and can also last like one week. And also on top of all of that, we are planning to build an educational center, a center of excellency, where the rest of the uh, 
of the doctors and engineers and prosthetic engineers will be able to learn from the best. At this very moment of time, we are trying to find the best ex experience all over the world to invite the best specialists to Ukraine to work, to volunteer, and to help us you know, to teach how to react on this um, healthcare disaster. The first uh, week, or the first year of the project will probably work with international doctors and they will team up with Ukrainian specialists. And at the moment we are basically in an urgent need and an urgent search for specialists in prosthetics, specialists in reconstructive surgeries, specialists in rehabilitation and psychological support. And I absolutely believe that everyone have a role to play in it. And we call our center Superhuman Center. And when we say about that, we basically um, visualize two pictures. We all believe that the war will end sooner or later because everything ends. And we can see Ukraine as a country with, where a lot of handicapped people on the streets, people without limbs and people who need assistance and people who are moving in wheelchairs with the crunches. And this is one picture of the world. But we see absolutely different picture. We see picture with the people on the streets, with the cool prosthetics, with bionic hands, with reconstructed faces, and being proud of what they came through. And this is absolutely different picture, and this is absolutely different future of my country. I want my country to see superheroes on the streets. I want to see superhumans, and I want to see people being proud for everything they came through and for everything they did. That's why we're building this center. You can find more at our website. And at this point, uh, I'm happy to be welcomed here at the um, Health Innovation Center because we are hoping for collaboration and we're hoping for new technology that we can bring in Ukraine. And we're also thinking about big work that we can, done, we can do with Philips in terms of education and bringing new technologies. I thank you very much for your attention. I ask for more support for Ukraine. That's everywhere we go, our politicians ask for weapons and we as, an, as a ordinary people, we ask for attention and we ask to spread the word about what's happening in Ukraine. And I do believe that one day, I will welcome you in Ukraine in Superhuman Center as specialists, as young specialists, as a professionals. And we will be able to change this world to a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olga, very much for this, your great inspirational speech. Uh, very inspiring, but also very important, because uh, this is excellent initiative uh, for victims of this horrible war. Uh, this project can make world better, uh, can make life of people injured by Russian aggression. Uh, question to the public, to the audience, if you have any comments and questions, so this is the right moment, so we are inviting you to the to the discussion about these projects. If not, we can go to the next presentation. Oh, one person. Mm -hmm. The question about the numbers uh, uh, incorporated in this presentation. Do you have uh, any explanation? Mm -hmm. We use data, data from the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Defense. The military data is classified in Ukraine. We don't see the number of military personnel injured uh, for many reasons. We only see the civilians injured. And um, this data is one, one month old, so the numbers are growing. But we only use the, the data that Ministry of Health and Ministry of Defense and Ministry of like, Infrastructure and uh, Ministry that works with uh, temporarily moved people. But one month in Ukraine is a very long period, so numbers are growing to a great pity uh, in a positive way because some people are, are returning back to Ukraine. We got a lot of people who returned back to Ukraine 
uh, before the September the 1st because people wanted to bring kids to school. And now we have all our schools closed from today till the end of this week because of the Russian aggression that just went up. So I don't know how many people will flee from Ukraine starting from today because of the you know growing aggression. And um, also I should say that we are progressing at the front lines. We're taking back our territories on a daily basis and uh, that cost us lives and that caused us terrorist attacks because our enemy is very angry. Many thanks, Olga, for your comprehensive answer. Any other comments, remarks, questions? If not, Mr. Professor. <clears throat> the second presentation is titled Healthcare Hits Reset, Priorities Shift as Healthcare Leaders Navigate a Change, a change uh, World. The presentation will be given by Tomasz Pilewicz, of course, from Philips, Poland. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, dear participants of HT conference. I would like to share with you with some findings of Philips research done since 2016 regularly each year. It's called Future Health Index, where we team up with clinicians and clinical leaders and ask them about priorities and their outlook on some events. So in the past, we've been asking about patient-centric care, about value-based care, about some paradigms. Uh, last year, we asked them about COVID and impact of pandemic on their world. And this year, in the first quarter where this research took place, we ask what's next, what's after pandemic? What are their priorities toward their staff, toward their patients? So this uh, was conducted among hospital directors, including Poland, and I would like to focus on Poland in this presentation today. We surveyed 200 uh, clinical leaders with mm, survey and direct individual interview and were able to present their uh, thoughts, their reflections at the benchmark of other healthcare leaders. And we see some distinguishing factors I would like to share with you today. So we focus on uh, the investments uh, priorities. Point number one was related to if this is to continue the investment trends, which last year was stopped because of coping with burden, coping with burnout, what would be the priorities? And we learned that it is more about proper usage of data and data analytics technologies to be better prepared to unpredicted events like um, demand-driven shocks, like demand-driven shocks uh, related to pandemic. There was also a very nice observation uh, what does sustainability for hospital means. In recent years, the trend was not so visible. And this year, because of the uplift of prices, inflation, and rising costs of electricity and resources, a lot of directors indicated that they would like to make their hospital more sustainable. So here at the plot, we can see uh, what are the focus on investments uh, for, for this year, which is always the second bar. And the second bar here represents 2022. Uh, we see increase in tools and software supporting clinician in their administrative work, so they could have more time for patients. And this uh, uh, data here also comments about whether hospital directors would like to use technology to help their patients beyond the hospital, like monitor them remotely, also in very non-invasive way to check how do they feel after the discharge. And we see that this is to 
be priority in the years to come. Last year it was not priority because every resource was focused on dealing with pandemic shock. We also learned uh, that uh, there is rising awareness about what is augmented intelligence discussed here in the scholar field as artificial intelligence and uh, how it's perceived where we see the benefits of it among hospital directors. Uh, they uh, see the main benefits uh, in the field of supporting clinical decisions, optimizing efficiency, so this, this has risen in comparison to last year, integrating diagnostics, so it is about using images for different modalities uh, for fusion and better, more accurate diagnosis, and also uh, uh, what is the trend, what is expected is that augmented reality will help to predict the outcomes. So now it's uh, a priority, uh, it's expected to grow. Sustainability, how it's uh, perceived. We see a big rise from 2021 to <laughs> 2022 uh, because of this uh, pressure on costs. Uh, and this is pressure not only re related to costs of care, but also of how the care is delivered. Many of patients uh, which, uh, mm, who, who were waiting for the admission in last year are now coming to hospitals with much uh, more, more, more health-related risk. So the sustainability here and being prepared to save patients has risen. Uh, we also see that this topic is uh, higher than in global average and uh, Netherlands. By global average, we mean other 15 countries uh, included in the research. Philips in that uh, dimension has launched special education campaign for hospital directors and managers on how to be more sustainable not only in using solutions like hardware software but also some uh, ways of working of scheduling patterns scheduling patients uh, there is also a um, teamwork with United Nations initiative for sustainability and uh, Global Green and Healthy Hospital Network, some publications on how to make hospitals more sustainable. One benchmark, which in fact is located in Poland, is Hospital in Volica, uh, which is a very unique place oriented on uh, sustainability, both environmental but also as a workplace. And it's uh, good to have such a benchmark to learn from. Uh, we also see uh, uh, increasing interest in, in the um, sustainability and uh, responsibility of uh, hospitals in a way that they believe they should enable patients to be better self-served. So patients, uh, in order to be better self-served, educated, uh, need to have some basic digital skills. So although we have a lot of initiatives like Mm, e-prescriptions, e-receipt, uh, and uh, a lot of these digitization initiatives without empowerment of patients, this will not be uh, optimally enabled. That saying, patients also need to know how to use this technology for patients, and this is shared here as this is a uh, responsibility of hospitals to enable patients to understand how to use technology for them including mobile technologies. Uh, another very interesting part investigated this year was how the data is used and uh, if the data is uh, collected in the hospital, whether the clinicians believe they can make most use of it. So that was one topic. Another was what are the barriers of using the data up to this uh, maximal extent. And uh, what do we hear uh, here uh, in these uh, plots? Very interesting and bars for Poland are in blue and the global benchmark is uh, in orange. Uh, in Poland, uh, the, the respondents, 50% of them express that their hospitals can extract insights from the data 
in 50% of cases versus the average is uh, uh, much higher. The average is 70%. So it's about ability in the hospitals to extract the insights from the data, to know what to do with what we learn from the data. Then the mm, being convinced that the data available in facility is accurate and uh, can serve the diagnosis which is first time right was shared by 47% versus almost 70 worldwide. This means that the clinicians are not always confident if the data they collect and the insight they formulate are accurate and they can be responsible for the decision uh, based on this. The last interesting aspect was the, the digital technology presence at the facility. So globally we see that almost uh, the, 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 there is twice bigger prevalence of digital technology needed in hospitals versus to what is in right now available in Poland. This can change because of the Digital Europe funding and a lot of initiatives also in Horizon Europe, like taking place uh, right now calls for proposal for flagship projects in augmented intelligence and uh, digitization of care. What are the barriers? The barriers, uh, number one, relate to change management and resistance of personnel, how to use new technology. So this is often missed factor that new technologies require communication, trainings, and champions at hospital level, people who are able to promote the benefits related to new way of working. So there is much uh, less barrier in knowledge or data and regulations. The biggest is, in fact, human-related resistance. Uh, what do we learn more? How to utilize data? What um, the, the leaders from uh, clinical field we investigated believe will improve. So they outline that there, there is a need for more clarity, availability also for data specialists and people uh, studying at faculty of biomedical engineering. So we hear more and more that there is a need for IT systems in medicine specialists uh, at hospital level to enable to interpret the data and support uh, decision making related to what we can learn from this data. Uh, in, in terms of how we can compare Poland to also Netherlands and global average here in below, uh, we see in this bar that only 2% of directors investigated believe that they have internally all expertise needed to use technology data collected. So this is very low percentage, modest approach, so to say, even if there is a lot of technology and promises related to advantage and benefits, the end users and personnel right now are not able to utilize it and to use it. So there is a room for trainings, education, communication. Um, we, we also uh, see here, this is like a cross check, that 72% uh, of respondents say that they have minimal amount of expertise needed. And the minimal amount means that there is some, and this is the most common answer given. Uh, we also checked what are the outlooks for partnering? What is the trust level among hospitals to partner with other organization? And these results here are very promising and uh, upbuilding, in fact. In the blue bars, we see um, uh, representatives of Polish hospitals, and the percentages are much higher than the global average that they are open to team up with technology providers, academia, uh, which in, in Poland is 10% bigger than on average, government and, and other institutions. What is looked for is specialist uh, services and training. We, we learned that it's not always about technology, but human resources, enablement of people with training, so they can later on know how to use technology and also build own solutions in, in some standards. We uh, investigated also last aspect, how to use predictive analytics, how to use forecasting solutions to help to accelerate uh, care delivery. 
and here we talk about two, we are talking about two things in this predictive uh, analytics one is what can we expect from population and their epidemiology in the future so how we could prepare our staff and our facility and second how we should um, uh, prepare our facility for renewal for improvement for updates and upgrades so this is uh, analytics related to, uh, to technology hardware software to not be surprised with some uh, stops in the um, delivery of of diagnosis and treatment uh, what we see here uh, leaders are um, very open to see the benefits in blue bars so uh, this this blue bar expresses like almost two-thirds of uh, respondents believe that analytics can help predicting variability of hospital personnel it's very uh, important to know how much personnel we will know to cope with the peaks of demand for care delivery how to smoothen the demand how to do some strategies if we are lagging and there is a long queue of patients so first the uh, functionality of what analytics could do is to solve HR problem. Then some scheduling, also scheduling of patients and managing QE of patients. Maintenance, this relates to technology. <coughs> and last one is uh, remote patient monitoring. Uh, what's the point of this analytics? And what, what uh, we found out is that this can help uh, in most uh, indications to improve patients' experience, patients' perception that they are better taken care of. Mm, the, the almost final findings relate to some, uh, mm, let's say, status where we are as uh, Polish facilities investigated versus the global average, and there is very little, like only 2% of having adopted analytics some hospitals are in the process uh, we see that 60 percent plans to adopt it in the next three years but currently it's very little it's been also caused by pandemic where the plans for investments were put on hold and there was uh, like a main strategy to cope with current situation not to think too much about what the tomorrow will bring uh, we, we, we found out that uh, the demand here for proper usage of this technology is huge and that this is also a great opportunity for students, uh, PhDs and researchers how to make adoption of technology in a proper way so it can be stick, meaning that people will use it, it will be paced with uh, their possibilities. So this report is available in public domain. It's called Future Health Index. If you put Future Health Index Poland, you will find version also in Polish. Uh, you will find findings uh, for global, but also Poland in Polish edition. Uh, we do the comparisons of Poland to Netherlands, as Netherlands is a home country of Philips, and a lot of practices are coming from there. Uh, we see that uh, the future is also determined by the uh, trust and uh, overcoming some barriers of adoption of these novel solutions with very very open very often asks and refers to security and security breaches however to uh, compare Poland and other Central and Eastern Europe countries we as a country are not the uh, most affected ones by data breaches, uh, including patient domain. So patients are still open uh, uh, to, to share their data with clinicians and within clinical care delivery networks to receive better care. So I'm very grateful that I could share these findings with you and I encourage you to uh, find more on Future Health Index of Philips. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, have you any questions or comments? No questions. Thank you once more. Uh, so, uh, next presentation. Uh,
design and analysis of uh, orthopedic devices with musco musculoskeletal models will be given by Michael Skipper Andersen from Alborg University. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk. Um, I'll be switching a little bit to some technical stuff compared to the other two previous presentations, but I hope that is okay. Um, so I'll be talking about the design and analysis of orthopedic devices with musculoskeletal model. So what is a musculoskeletal model? So that is a model where we try to make a representation of the bones, the muscles, ligaments, joints, so that we, with measurements from the outside, like information about how a subject moves and how they are in the forces that they are applying on the external world, how that is kind of driven by all of the internal forces, so forces in muscles, for, uh, forces in the joints, ligaments, and so on that we can't measure uh, non-invasively. And we'll spend a lot of time on making models like this, and I'll show you how you can actually use them in the design of some of orthopedic devices. So. What, what are the roles that I see where we can use models like this? So one is to try and get a basic understanding of, um, of underlying mechanisms of the human musculoskeletal system. I'll show some examples of that. We can use the model um, as like a virtual prototype. So if we have some ideas of a device that I would like to design, how would that device actually influence the human? And I can actually use this combination to try and optimize the design of this, even before I build it. Um, we can use models to adjust to uh, subject-specific characteristics. So that could be some parameters of the device I'm trying to design. How do I optimize it for some specific person where I have created a model for? And then in the end, we can also use it if, if we actually manufacture some device we would like to evaluate. And what is then the effect on the internal loads with this specific device on this specific prop, uh, person for some of the parameters that we can actually measure in the lab? And I'd like to show an example, which is actually a knee brace design where we actually took a all the way through from the start to the end of this, and I'll show you how you can actually do some of this stuff. Uh, so the disease we were looking into is osteoarthritis, which is uh, it's a growing disease in the world because of the aging population and also because we are seeing more and more people in the world and people living longer and longer. And uh, walking disability that you see in elderly is frequently or primarily caused by osteoarthritis. Um, which is a slow degenerative joint disease that affects most frequently the hips and knees. And also hips and knees is also why you have walking disabilities, but it also affects other joints, spines, hands, feet, and so on, other parts of the body. Um, the symptoms are typically pain, reduced function, and reduced um, quality of life. The big challenge is there's no cure, so there's no known cure for how to actually stop the progression of this, uh, this disease. And therefore, existing um, treatments, they kind of aim to improve function and reduce the symptoms. So if you look in the literature, you'll find many different suggestions for treatments of these patients. So this could range from uh, anti-inflammatory drugs and painkillers to insoles, knee braces, people are prescribed training, and then at the end, um, the last outcome is to give people a new joint replacement. But you want to postpone that as long as possible. So there's this gap in the middle where we don't really know what to do and what to give uh, other people. Um, I'll be talking at knee braces um, today, just as one example of how you can look into that with things like this. So one very common brace um, that you can find everywhere is what we call a valgus brace for knee uh, osteoarthritis. This one is intended for people that have osteoarthritis on the medial side of the knee. Um, and the, kind of the fundamental reason why they're making a brace like this is that if you look at the loading situation, so I have some person walking here, and if I plot the ground reaction force, it is more or less pointing towards your center of gravity of somewhere here, or sorry, your center of mass. Um, and then it will actually pa not pass through the midline of the knee, but it's actually passing to the medial side. So it's creating like a valgus moment on the, on the knee. Um, so that's why, um, you build a brace, which is trying to counteract this by then shifting the load from the medial to lateral compartment. So try and shift the loads that you see in here in the, in the frontal plane. However, um, as you probably can imagine, this cannot be a very large moment that you can apply with straps and then you're applying it on the, um, on the skin and so on. There's also problems with the soft tissue moving underneath and so on. So actually making large load in this, uh, in this area is quite difficult. And there was also some very varying clinical results. 
However, if we look a little bit into the biomechanics of the problem, then muscle contractions actually contribute even more to the contact force that you see in the knee compared to what the knee adduction moment is. So when you want to contract the knee, so suppose you wanted to, for instance, flex your knee, then you would contract your hamstrings, which, because they have, a, they have to generate this external moment, they are actually also contributing with contact force. And this is actually about two-thirds of all the loads that you see in the knee is actually coming from the contractions of the muscles. So another strategy could be, can I actually get the muscles to do less? So can I somehow offload what the muscles actually have to do? Then I might be able to reduce what the load is in the knee. Um, how could you then go about doing that? I mean, how, how can you offload? If I want to take the load off the knee, how can I do that? And there are many different approaches you could do to that. But one thing, one thing we can do is try to understand what happens. So like, what would happen if I tried to apply a moment at the knee? some moment at the knee. What would happen internally to the forces? What would happen if I do something at the hip? Or what would happen if I do something at the ankle? What would the consequence be? And I could use models like this for this. So what I will start with is some data we collected on 10 healthy subjects. And they were asked to walk just normal self-selected speed in a motion capture laboratory. So we have markers and we have measured external forces. And then we created a computational models like the one you see over here, which can estimate what is the load in the knee when they're just walking. And then I can use this model to then investigate what happens if I start applying some external load that I might then design in the end to become a brace. Um, what we investigate is what, what would happen if I try to compensate what the muscles have to do to create flexion and extension at the hip. And then you might wonder why on earth would you think about doing something at the hip if you're talking about loading in the knee. But the thing is that we actually have a lot of muscles that are biarticular here. So we have muscles that cross from pelvis all the way across the knee. And the same goes if you look at the ankle, right? Gastrocnemius crosses all the way up to the knee, right? So what actually happens in the knee is also affected by what happens at the hip and ankle. So there might actually be good ideas of offloading, looking at some of the other joints as well. So we try to do that, offload what would happen if I offload the hip, what happens if I offload the knee, and what would happen if I offload the ankle to some, some degree. So what we did was, in the model, we then looked at what is the required moment at each of the joints, and then we applied a fraction of that, so like an idealized uh, external brace that I might be able to make. Um, so not compensating all of it, but compensating a fraction of what is needed at each point in cycle in time. This is what you would then find. Um, what you see over here on the left side is the set up to 70% of the gait cycle. So we have heel strike here, and then we have toe off around here. And what you will typically see if you look at the total compressive force is this double hump, so that you have a, what we call first and a second loading peak. And what, if, what happens if you start compensating what the muscles have to do at the knee? So if you offload what the flexion moment they are carrying at the knee, is that you will see that it only basically only affects the first peak. So you can offload, if you could, take away what the muscles have to do uh, with, a, with a knee brace, you can actually basically only affect what happens at the first peak. You can't affect what happens at the second peak. But if you, on the other hand, you do something that compensates the ankle plantar dorsiflexion, so a brace actually compensated the ankle, you'll be affecting the, the second peak. So what one could think about, maybe to do a, some combination of brace that tries to attack, compensate only this little part here to offload the first peak, and something at the ankle to offload the second peak. Maybe that's possible. Um, a couple of just a sum up of, the, uh, of what we found in that particular study is that the first peak, you can reduce that by a knee moment. I didn't show it, but you can also do it a bit with the hip, not as much. And then the second peak is primarily dominated what happens at the ankle, also a little bit of what happens at the, at the hip. OK. Then we went out and literature. what actually exists is that some other people have tried to offload some of these uh, peaks with some designs. And then we found actually uh, uh, some people in, in Collins here in 2015 had developed a brace to actually offload what the castrocnemius is doing, kind of doing the second peak. So they, they, this kind of idea with an external spring that you can switch in and out, you can actually offload the second peak. So that already existed. But we couldn't find anything that, or anyone that has actually shown that you can reduce the first peak with some applied external moment. Just to demonstrate that it might actually be possible. So can you actually do that? Can you make some device that can actually demonstrate this principle to start with? So that's what we wanted to do. So can we make it a, a brace that has the kind of the ambition of offloading the first peak during the cycle with some external moment? So the first thing engineers would then do is then look at what, how does that moment curve actually look? So what would it require to do? 
And if you then take a plot, the, the knee flexion extension moment as a function of the knee flexion angle, you get a curve that looks like this. I'll walk you through it. It's, it's a complicated uh, little swervy curve here, but I will show you what it shows. So if we take a look at it, we take our, like what we had before, so our net um, force on the knee. Here we have heel strike and here we have toe off. And then we trace around how this curve over here. Then it starts with heel strike, which is the first dot here. Then you will follow the curve going down here and going up here. And the second peak is actually, the first peak is happening here, where you have the biggest external uh, extension moment at the knee happening around here. And then you will follow this down, down to this point, where the foot is kind of flat in the middle, down all the way where it kind of peaks at the bottom. There it's where you see the second peak is. And then, of course, you swing, and then you have a very low moment doing the swing phase. The interesting thing here is that if you look at what happens from here to here, it's almost a straight line. So basically what this tells an engineer is that I just need a torsional spring. So I should be able to offload what happens at the first peak if I can just basically make myself a, a, a linear spring in this interval. Of course, it cannot apply any moment before and it cannot apply any moment after, but it somehow is linear in this, uh, in this interval. Then the first idea would be, okay, then I would just need some very large torsional springs. It would be very bulky, 45 Newton meters on average here, so I probably shouldn't be building it like this. It also has to somehow disengage and engage somehow, so I can probably not do it with some torsional springs. I probably need to come up with something else to make something in this. So the idea we came up with was to do it with like a four-bar mechanism. And engineers like me love four-bar mechanisms. They are such cool mechanisms. Um, so the idea would be that we have um, two bars that attach to the thigh and the shank, and then we create a four-bar mechanism with like a linkage more here. And then we attach a uh, basically a string in this. So we have a spring attached down here, and then just one long string that follows this path here. And what would happen is that when you flex the knee, you're actually pulling on this string, which would then make an extension moment. And you just need to make sure that you cannot pull on the string when there's no need for any external moment. Um, so it will look like something like this. So we have our curve. We want to only generate something in this small interval. So then we would start with heel strike. This uh, clutch mechanism that should engage the string should be loose. So we should have no moment. Until we hit this particular point, then we should detect when that is. We should lock the mechanism so that when we go from here forward, the string is kind of pulled. Because that would be pulling on the spring down here. Then we would be applying an external moment. For this part of the time, we come back down to 0.4. Then we should detect that we have to loosen it again. And then we should leave it loose for the whole swing phase until we come back again. In principle, then you should apply some moment and offload the first peak if you can build this. So first thing was we tried then to make a kind of computational model of just a simple four-bar mechanism with a, uh, with a string in it to try and find out what should the properties of this uh, of this string be and how stiff should this, uh, the spring be to actually do this. Um, once you then start simulating it, so because this doesn't become a fully linear system as it in, uh, ideally should be, it becomes a nonlinear system because the four-bar mechanism is nonlinear. But if you tune it, you can actually get a, a curve that looks like this. This is the, the moment that this brakes would be applying if you fine tune it to this. So if you detect that you should start here end it there, then you can actually get something like this. And if you then look in the model, what happens to the first peak, you actually take away from up to 2,000 newton, a little bit less, down to 12, 1,300 newton, so around 1,000 newton less in load, in principle, if, uh, if this works. Then we started looking at how do some of the patients move, because it's also um, the patients don't move the same, and they are walking in different ways. So we recorded for just to start with six uh, medial OE patients, and then we plotted this curve. And some interesting ones, so like the one down here, has a really long loading curve for something like this. So I would think a brace like this, you should be able to take away a lot of the load. Then there's one like this, and one like, where is this one here? Where this loading up to the first peak almost doesn't exist. So I should probably not try to do a brace like this or offload the knee like this in patients like this. But there might be some candidates where this could make sense to try and do. Let me build it. It became very bulky and the first, uh, first go or first prototype or something, but we manufactured one with the mechanisms and we had like a counting mechanism up to detect when we should engage in. This engage, we have a 
the spring that you can see down here. And then we also made a force transducer so we could measure how much force we're actually applying. And then we have the string around here. Then we took it to the lab, motion capture lab. We put, equipped first one healthy subject with this uh, brace and asked the person to walk with and without and also with different levels of the spring on it. So I think I have a video here. Jonas, my uh, PhD student, he was walking first without it and walking with it and then recording the external forces and so forth. We also measured EMG just to have an idea what the vasti muscle is doing at the same time. And then we took the brace and we imported it into a model so that I can actually evaluate what happens with my internal forces, so a full computational model of the brace, including a model to then try and estimate what are the loads within the, within the body. And this is what we found. So this is the graph that we had from before. This is now on this subject. So here we have heel strike, we have toe off, and we have the total load here. And of course, the brace was designed to only attack the first peak. So so that's the one we should be looking at. The red one is no brace up here. And then if you, the K0 is the brace on, but no, uh, but no spring. And then we try to increase the spring stiffness. And what you see is that uh, you can actually reduce the, also in the subject, when he was walking, we reduce the loading that happens on the, on the first peak. And if you look at the EMGs, so the muscle activities of vastus medialis and vastus lateralis, you're actually seeing the same thing. No brace, and once we then put the brace on, but not activated, the load went up because, of course, you had to carry around a bunch of mass more, so the activity went up. But if you want to, when you start to increase the, the, the spring stiffness, you can actually start bringing down the activity of the muscles, kind of demonstrating that those muscles are doing less for this activity. We also tried on one patient, and the result is, is basically the same. So you, you can also reduce the first piece on this patient. Right, just to sum up, so I think muscular skeletal models like this can play a role in kind of multiple parts of design stages of devices. So I think we can use them to understand and see if we can get some good ideas from, from some mechanisms we might be able to build. We can use it for virtual prototyping, adjust to subject specific biomechanics, and then of course evaluate what happens with the internal loads that we can't uh, measure. A, co a bunch of limitations still on what you can do. So this is predicting kind of the immediate biomechanical response, but we're not looking at the adaptation to this change over time because the person might start walking in a very different way after some time if you start offloading it like this. Um, yeah, and we're not looking into the kind of compensation mechanism, so also movement and tissue adaptations and so on. But of course, that's something that would be very nice to look at in the future. Yeah, that's all I would like to say. So thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Professor Mike has a, one question. Great. I'm really impressed of your achievements. And thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, Professor Anderson, could you tell us about disadvantages of the anybody soft? I know <laughs> that, that you know very, very useful and popular soft, the soft. And my second question is, how do you modeling muscles and what kind of uh, algorithms of optimization do you use? Thanks. Yeah, I think the first one, I'm not the right one to ask about. That very bad. I mean, I have developed a bunch of the stuff, right? But I, I'm, of course, we're only looking at rigid body mechanics, right? So if you want to know of something about more on the tissue response and adaptation, stuff like that, the models, the models can't do that. And also, right now, we're kind of limited to inverse dynamics. So you have observed movements, and then you're looking what happens there. So changes in movement and so on, we don't do much of. Um, the other question was on. Yeah, so right now, the muscles are modeled with the hill type. Uh, muscle models are taking into account contraction dynamics and also uh, um, and basically the stiffness properties of the tissue, so elastic energy transfers and, and that kind of stuff. So, but it's basically a hill type uh, muscle model that, that we have implemented. What kind of optimization yeah, right now on this one, this was done with the quadratic. Um, uh, optimization so that because you have many more muscles then you have degrees of freedom in this system so you have to make some assumption on how the load is distributed but there's not one choice you can actually choose many different ones so you have good ideas on the other ones but this one was done with a quadratic uh, criterion but if you have some like high velocity or maximum loads then it might make sense to switch to like a mean max criterion where you utilize maximum the, the potential of the system but I think it depends on what the, what activity you're looking into what you should be doing there but it's a good question.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Professor, uh, I've got a question about this uploading system. Have you checked uh, because you change the gate pattern if yeah. you use this? Have you checked uh, how it influences uh, some other joints like joints in lower limb, uh, spine, and so on? Yeah, I now I can't remember the what it is, but the model we we estimated for basically all of the loads up to pelvis, not the spine. So, but we could go back and look at the model what happens at the hip and the ankle. We didn't, I did, we didn't do that specifically in uh, in this one. Yeah, so it can influence in a different way. True. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Okay, we have another. I agree with that. We, we started with just, uh, you know, flat yeah. surface, bare feet and so on, because the brace was difficult to make. Oh, oh, yes, <laughs> so, yes. But of course, that's the next thing, right? But then you need to uh, work out when should you detect events. So, right, this was here now, because this one, it was very consistent with all the subjects we saw, that it, it was just a matter of finding some knee flexion angle. Then you could detect this on all of them. But it might not be the case if you start walking on soft surfaces and on gravel or going up and down stairs and all these stuff. Then you have to figure out some more intelligence on that, right? Okay. That's a good question. Okay. So big thanks goes to Professor Michael Skipper Addison for uh, insightful and highly expertise uh, presentation on uh, musculoskeletal models and visual um, um, prototyping, so great. And uh, last but not least, a presentation in this part of, of uh, conference uh, uh, about the engineering support for preventing football players' injuries. Uh, and uh, the, the, the speech will be delivered by Jacek Jurkowicz uh, from Sajian University of Technology. So Mr. Professor, the floor is yours. We are waiting for you and for your inspiring speech. Uh, okay, because only I was introduced, uh, I would like to uh, invite and, pr and present, uh, because we divide our presentation into two, and I would like to uh, present the first presenter, uh, Iga Garboska, and here I'd like to emphasize and explain her presence here, because she is uh, the person uh, who made it possible that Robert Lewandowski mentioned here by some people, uh, was here at our uh, university uh, in our f f faculty and in the center. Uh, that's why I'd like to ask uh, Iga to start this presentation about uh, something what we currently um, creating uh, in our uh, in our center here. And then I will say some assumptions of the center and I will try to invite you to, uh, to cooperate with us. But uh, first I ask Iga to start this presentation. Um, hello, my name is Iga Garbowska and I uh, came here to tell you something about dreams because all the technical details will tell my friend Professor uh, Jacek Jurkoic and um, I'd like to tell you something about uh, 2015 when I first time uh, had a chance to cooperate with uh, Jacek Jurkoic, and then um, we uh, done some examination for um, for patient after the stroke, and it was very fascinated because uh, the, uh, um, the people who came to examine our patients uh, show us the way of looking of them for total different. Uh, point of view. Uh, but um, when I started to think about the interdisciplinary team, 
uh, I was uh, it, it was obviously for me that uh, the scientists have a great and very uh, huge uh, uh, details to show us uh, which will be very um, very and deeply truly because uh, sometimes when we examine our patients, when we think about them in the medical point of view, we of course don't have this kind of uh, um, skills what uh, have a professional scientist. Uh, so um, the, re the, the the I think the. The, mo the most important goal uh, of this teamwork interdisciplinary is uh, to give a chance to uh, evaluate it, uh, our skills to, to be a, a better, for example, a better football player. But the player uh, need to have a clear communication with us because in this uh, in in this um, i think um, interdisciplinary work team the the the, the huge uh, problem was that we spoke in the different kind of way and we had to spend a lot of time to find the solution uh, about our goal, about way of communicating with uh, all of us and with a team uh, uh, which supporting uh, our players uh, about uh, that what have to know the coach and the family uh, and also uh, give some tips for the medical team which have their own goal as well. And uh, it was a huge, um, I think, uh, huge pleasure for all of us to become, I think, the first interdisciplinary team in uh, our country, but maybe also in the Europe, because it was a first time when the people from different kind of world uh, become uh, become work together for for the one goal, and now uh, I think uh, Jacek uh, will tell you uh, our vision for the new times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ika. Uh, it's a pleasure to cooperate with you. You said, <coughs> I'm sorry. You said about cooperation, and I think that this cooperation and uh, gathering people together is the most important thing, which uh, was the base for this uh, uh, present and I hope fu uh, future cooperation and work we, and research which we do. Uh, because very often we cooperate just uh, person to person, institution to institution, but uh, I think that uh, we should start think uh, we, should start, we should start thinking that. We should gather uh, and uh, build something bigger, and this is what we try to do here, uh, from creating this center, which uh, is formed here by this European Health Tech Innovation Center. Here we can see uh, people, because I should say people, not only institutions, but so there are some institutions, but generally. Uh, there are people, very valuable people, on Earth, people we can uh, cooperate with and build uh, the center with the center which we start uh, built here. Uh, we can say that this uh, the center f uh, is focused for football pl players, but I think that in the future uh, we can say that it, it will be uh, for general sportsmen. Uh, but we start with football players. And we uh, decided to, uh, to, 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 to have two assumptions of the center. The first one is uh, the target group. Of course, there are football players, but uh, if, we if we look at football players, we've got kids, we've got teenagers, we've got uh, professional football players. And uh, the aim of these uh, people 
is a little bit, a little bit different. Because when we look at kids, uh, so for them, of course, for, they try to compete. But uh, when we look as adult uh, or parents, for, uh, so for us, much more important is development of, <coughs> of uh, these kids, their health. And that's why we decided that the first target group, uh, there are kids. And here we, we try to, uh, to do some uh, measurements, to do uh, some uh, research in order to uh, enable this uh, proper development of this uh, of this group of, of uh, these kids. When we go to the another group uh, to uh, teenagers, so there of course this development uh, and their health is still important, but they try to compete. They they've got some uh, very serious uh, f competitions. So then we've got different. Uh, different aims for these groups. It's of course still this in deficit correction, but we should start uh, to uh, help them to be better and better football players. So when we go to prof professional football players, so it, it here it's again something different because the first thing which we should uh, try to do here is not to damage is, uh, their skills because it's very important. Uh, but it's very and uh, it's very easy uh, to try to help them to be healthier, to, for example, work better. But in the same way, we can uh, do something with their natural skills and uh, their they, they became much worse football players. That's why uh, three different aims, but one, uh, one main aim, prevention of injuries, and the second one is diagnosis of chronic diseases. Uh, and the second assumption is uh, division into four groups uh, of, uh, let's say, research, measurements, uh, work. And the first one is connected with general uh, assertion of motion on organ. And the second one, advanced engineering measurements, which we do here. The third one, cooperation with trainers and uh, training analysis. And the fourth one, specialist, special, uh, specialist medical diagnostics. And some examples what I uh, what I what we see here what we what we uh, what these groups mean. So the first one, the yellow one, motion organ assessment, diet selection, or assessment of hearing or vision organs. Uh, the third one, the black one, is cooperation with trainers, and this red measurements between them because both these groups need these measurements and uh, measurements which which are which can be conducted here but in the center, in the European uh, Health Tech Innovation Center, or we can go to, uh, to that football, football players. The fourth group, cooperation with uh, some hospitals, with some specialists of uh, such, uh, uh, like cardio cardiological, uh, cardiologists, uh, neurologists, or, and the third one, <coughs> which is, in our opinion, very, very important, evaluation of dental system. <coughs> of course, we are aware that uh, that's not all. That's there is this question mark because we are open for new cooperation and for uh, your uh, proposals. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, because I said about this. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Could you? Uh, I didn't know that there is so. There are lots of this. Uh, because we are here in this European Center, uh, so I would like to say a few words about this, what uh, you will be able to see uh, later. And the first... Uh, okay, the first uh, example is motion analysis system, the laboratory with motion analysis systems. We can do these measurements here uh, in this laboratory, but we can also go to the pitch to the football players and do plenty of measurements uh, there uh, in their clubs. Uh, the second uh, example of measurements, there are hearing measurements and uh, measurements of sight. Uh, we can uh, do very prof professional measurements of, uh, of uh, hearing as well as uh, I we use eye tracking system in order to, for example, check uh, the focus focal points of uh, during uh, playing during some uh, tests or uh, exercises. Uh, 
The third, the third example that has stabilographic uh, measurements where we use uh, where we use virtuality, but we also use some special equipment in order to not only to stop on very typical measurements, just like with open and closed eyes, by, but we uh, try to uh, try to use some uh, s such things like virtuality, for example, in order to uh, f uh, broaden this uh, possibilities of such measurements. Uh, this, this virtuality. Uh, According to our experiences, it gives us uh, it gives a completely new sight on uh, stabilographic measurements or, or gate assessment because uh, people start using completely different comp uh, strategy of uh, balancing or walking, and in this way we are able to detect uh, some, some things which are not able to detect when we use only. Uh, standard stabilographic measurements, and this uh, can explain us for ex some deficits which can be seen, for example, during uh, playing. And uh, this, what is important, uh, I think here, is that we use uh, not uh, not only typical typical quantities which uh, are used uh, in medical centers, but we uh, form we, we create uh, completely new. Uh, quantities which can be used in such measurements and which explain some behaviors, explain some deficits, uh, explain some quantities uh, and the uh, and change in uh, in these quantities uh, by means of this uh, by, by means of this <coughs> what we uh, prepare here. Here I would like to uh, thanks one ag once again for the whole group uh, which was responsible for these measurements with Robert Lewandowski and inf invite you for cooperation. Thank you very much. <coughs> what I can say, super important topic as it is in the core of, of, uh, of Seijian University of Technology Competencies in the DNA of university in Zabrze. This is the flagship initiative uh, which combines medicine and professional sport. Am I right, Professor Gzik? Um, I'm right. So it is the creme de la creme uh, or uh, key specialization uh, for Silesian region. So hope I will see questions, remarks or thoughts about this uh, speech. So do not hesitate to raise hands. If not, uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, everybody who presented uh, during the, this part of conference. Uh, it was the last uh, presentation in this part. In the agenda uh, of this. Topics, uh, let me invite you. Uh, to the lunch break, and the break will take till to half past two. Enjoy the lunch and please return to the conference room at half past two for the next set of presentation during the second part of this conference. Many thanks. <laughs>